This is not, when you look at Barack Obama, Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, the modern Democrat Party, this is not your father's or grandfather's Democrat Party. This is not Harry Truman, this is not JFK, and it's not Bill Clinton, which explains, again, Clinton peeling off from Obama. This is a completely different ball of wax. These are the far left, radical, anti-American kooks that have finally grabbed the brass ring. In the book, I trace the rise of the kooks, and there have been other kooks that have been successful in American politics. Woodrow Wilson, uh, an epic progressive. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, an epic progressive. You never learn any of this in school, right? You learn that Teddy Roosevelt's an American hero and a rough rider, and he was a true blue progressive. So the kooks have had successes in, in the past, but they were always looking for grabbing the brass ring of both the presidency and Congress in order to fundamentally transform the nation. They do not believe that free market capitalism is a good thing. They believe it's grossly immoral and needs to be destroyed in the name of social justice and replacing it with redistributionism, socialism. They also do not believe that America is a force for good in the world, that we've been a giant bully, that we have been guilty of genocide and murders and wars, and that we're a force for evil in the world, therefore, we should be taken down a notch or two or ten. This is Obama's entire philosophy. This is the philosophy of the kooks. 1968 comes along. My own boss, President Nixon, wins the presidency for the first time. But something on the left also happens, and that is that the, ko the kooks take over the Democrat Party. It was a wholesale takeover by the kooks of the Democrats. 1968 was the last totally pro-American presidential uh, Democrat ticket in Humphrey Muskie. After that, kooks take over and they start nominating kook after kook for the presidency. So you get George McGovern, you get, um, you get Al Gore, you get Walter Mondale, you get John Kerry, kook after kook, kooks coming at us, <laughs> kooks. And we've got to beat back the kooks. And we were successful in beating back the kooks. And what's interesting is that the only time, and, and Watergate accepted with Jimmy Carter, because that was an aberration. And actually, Gerald Ford came very close to actually defeating Jimmy Carter. So we accept Jimmy Carter. But the only time that the Democrats do not nominate a kook after 1968 was when they won not once but twice, and that was Bill Clinton. Now, we know he was kooky in other ways. However, he was a moderate Arkansas Democrat from the South who was a pragmatist, not an ideologue. His wife is an ideologue, but he was a pragmatist. He was a political animal. And he also knew that he wanted to not just survive in office, but thrive in office. And therefore, that required trade-offs with the Republicans. Republicans get elected uh, in 94 and take over the House, and now he's got the, the restraints put on him to prevent any kind of kookdom. But Clinton, Hillary is total kook, but Bill Clinton knew better. He knew better, he's a very savvy guy. And he did everything he could, especially after 94, when the Republicans were right there to stop him, but he did everything he could to drag his party back to the center. This was a guy who was head of the DLC, the Democrat Leadership Council. He was a moderate. Cut spending, okay, raised uh, taxes, but cut, cut the capital gains tax and actually restrained spending. So Bill Clinton was not a kook. And he spent a lot of his time beating off the kooks, including his wife. <laughs> I think he's still doing that. <laughs> but this explains a really big schism happening right now in the Democrat Party, which is is symbolized by Barack Obama versus Bill Clinton, because Clinton sees what Obama and the kooks are doing to the party. But it wasn't until 2008, and, and I actually trace this back, I trace it back to sort of 1996 when Obama starts to be cultivated by unseen kook forces. And I mean, I write about, he writes a memoir at the age of like 28. Who writes a memoir <laughs> at 28? except for like Drew Barrymore and child stars, right? Who have been like rehab 18 times by the time they're 28. They're the only ones who write memoirs at that age. 
He wrote Dreams from My Father, although some people suspect Bill Ayers wrote Dreams from My Father, but he writes it and he puts it out for one reason, not because he thought he had something to share with the world, but because he knew back then that he was going to do this and that he'd have very powerful kook support to make it all the way to the top. And so he writes his autobiography at a very early age as a preemptive strike because then he could later say when he's running for president, no need to look into my background, no need to investigate all those you know, shadowy parts of my background. It's all right here in the book. Check it out. It's all right here. And the press, the lap dogs, fell for it. And they didn't do their jobs. <laughs> that, that, by the way, that, that bark, that was a very good impression of the lapdog press. That was awesome. Thank you for that. 